Thanks for dropping into our continuing series of virtual meetings at the Sydney Institute at a time of pandemic, uh, which have been very successful, and thanks to our members and supporters who are giving us questions to ask at the question discussion time. So today we have Warren Mundine and Josephine Cashman, uh, well known to both of you, and the topic is Indigenous Australians at the time of Black Lives Matter. Now I'll introduce both our speakers briefly, they both speak for about 15 minutes and then we'll go to questions and discussion and finish uh, at, the, at the top of the hour. So Warren Mundine is a, a, a commentator in the media, a former national president of the Australian Labor Party, a former Liberal Party candidate in the Gilmore uh, seat in, in New South Wales at the, at the last federal election. Uh, he works in business development and venture capital and he's author of, and this was the last time he was at the Sydney Institute, Warren spoke Berkowitz about his book, Warren Mundine, in black and white, race, politics, and change in Australia. And we have Josephine Cashman making a welcome first appearance at the Sydney Institute, a lawyer. Josephine's a former prosecutor, and she's chair of the Big River Impact Foundation, which is a benevolent institution. So many thanks to both our speakers, and we'll lead off with Warren, then we go to Josephine, and then to questions and discussion. Thank you. Um Jerry for the introduction. Uh, I'm pleased to be here at the Sydney Institute to talk about Indigenous Australians in the time of uh, Black Lives Matters. Uh, I also wish to acknowledge we're here on the traditional lands of the Gadigal uh, people, a stone throw from where the first fleet landed almost uh, 230 years ago. I recognise and pay my respects to the Gadigal uh, uh, ancestors and elders and my own Bundjalunga, Banga, Ewan and Irish ancestors and elders as well. Following the horrific killing of uh, George Floyd, a black American in Minneapolis, there had been an uproar uh, about black deaths at the hands of police officers in the United States of America. There have been rioting across the country uh, which have resulted in vandalism, looting, shootings, assaults, the graffiti of and the ripping down of statues, and memorials. Injuries of and deaths of both police and civilians, which has morphed into a Black Lives Matters campaign globally. And Australia has not been spared. Although it has not been uh, near the scale nor violence of, of the United States or the United Kingdom. After the horrific killing of George Floyd by the Minneapolis police in the United States, Australian activists marched in solidarity with American activists and took the opportunity to highlight the Indigenous deaths in custody. Protesters called for truth talking. So what I want to do today is actually talk about, let's talk some truths, all of them. And for me, truth number one, there has been some appalling deaths of Indigenous people at the hands of police, intentionally, uh, through sheer reckless, recklessness, incompetence, or shrouded in suspicion. I have protested and advocated on some of these matters myself. Some terrible examples are the death of John Pat in Western Australia in Roeburn, uh, Eddie Murray in uh, New South Wales, and Miss Dow uh, in Western Australia. Mr Dumaji, who died in a Palm Island police station with a ruptured liver and spleen, and Mr Ward, who was cooked to death and left in a prison van for four hours with temperatures reaching something like 56 degrees. Convictions for uh, killings by police have also historically proved difficult, both in Australia and the United States, and including uh, not only uh, black deaths, but white deaths and other deaths as well, generating an immense anger and frustration. George, George Floyd's death, too, was dreadful, and I'm yet to hear anyone of any political persuasion to say otherwise. Truth number two, Indigenous uh, people represent 17% of deaths in custody, despite being only 3% of the Australian population. But Indigenous people also represent over 27% of all prisoners. So when you look at the statistics, Indigenous people are less likely to die in custody the non-Indigenous people. This is, this is in part due to the actions taken to prevent Indigenous deaths in custody since the 1991 Royal Commission. 
Truth number three is protest has quote 434 Indigenous deaths in custody since the Royal Commission. These are deaths for any reason. It's not, it's not as if they are deaths that have been caused by police officers or corrective services officers. If a prisoner dies from suicide, a heart attack, natural causes or cancer and is or is killed by another prisoner or if someone drowns while trying to escape police, it is a death in custody. As noted by the Royal Commission, Indigenous people are more likely to die in custody because they're more likely to be in custody. And higher incarceration rates largely come down to two things, violence and reoffending. I chaired the, uh, the, the, the panel into uh, adult prisons and reoffending in South Australia in 2016 that wasn't specifically focused on Indigenous deaths or black deaths, it was focusing on the, the entire prison systems. And we found that most people who were in jail, more than 57% of Indigenous pre prisoners, are incarcerated for violent offences. And Indigenous people made up 18% of those incarcerated for homicides and sexual assault. Indigenous suicide rates are also doubling the non-Indigenous rates. Truth number four, Indigenous people are also dis dis disproportionately victims of homicide and violence offences. There were some 951 Indigenous homicide victims, 13% of all victims, between the 1st of July 1989 to the 30th of June 2012. So that was up to 2012. So by 2020, you could, you could really guess that the figure would, would be well in the thousands. A West Australian report found Aboriginal women in Western Australia were 17 times more likely to be murdered. Indigenous women are 34 times more likely to be hospitalised for domestic violence. Black Death Matters protesters do not march for these, these lives. In fact, they've only selected at least 432, which not necessarily have been, in fact, in vast majority of cases, have had, had nothing to do with police brutality or uh, corrective services brutality. Truth number five, there has never been a better time in the last 200 years to be an Indigenous Australian. There are no longer discriminative laws against an Indigenous people. In fact, the last laws in New South Wales were did away with in 1969 and the early 70s. Uh, Land rights and native title has given back to Indigenous people more than 20% of Australia's land mass, and I predict it will grow to over 70% over the next 20 years uh, when we look at the court cases that are going through the system at the moment. Federal and state governments spend billions of dollars annually on improving the lives of Indigenous people. Attendance rates of Indigenous people at university in 2015 was 15,585. Uh, when I was a kid, the idea of actually get, going to university was unheard of. In fact, I remember when Charles Perkins visited us when we were in Grafton, uh, South Grafton, where I, I lived at the time, as a kid, uh, we knew universities, we never heard of the word before, but we knew it was important because it, all the elders were talking in husked voices about Charles Perkins, this university graduate. Aboriginals with a degree in 2014 numbered over 30,000 and varying degrees. You're looking at lawyers, doctors, engineers, accountants, teachers, and the list just goes on. In excess of two, in 19, uh, no, 2015, the 1st of July 2015, the federal government announced the Indigenous procurement policy. And in that policy, they said, over a period of five years, there was going to be a, a, a three percent of government contracts would go to Indigenous businesses that could meet the the standard of actually delivering on those contracts. 
Since then, it was $6.7 million in 2015, the 1st of July. $6.7 million were going to uh, Indigenous businesses. As of this year, I um, mean the end of last year, uh, 2019, in excess of $2 billion of federal government contracts is going to Indigenous businesses. I have not met a person nor a corporation who does not want to make a difference for Indigenous people, a, a big difference in their life. And if we go through some of the things that we look at, which you know, you, you destroy some of the myths, uh, where people think that Aboriginal people are against mining, there is over in excess of 6,000 Indigenous people working in the mining industry, from tradies, from plant operators, uh, from, from working in the back offices, uh, to uh, doing engineers, and so on. And the mining industry actually puts into uh, Indigenous uh, communities something like $4 billion on an annual basis. So when we look back at the Black Deaths uh, Matter campaigns, I'm a great believer that all lives matter, but looking at the Black Deaths campaign, you're given the impression that 432 people have been brutalised by police and have been murdered and corrective services officers. And in actual fact, that is not true. In fact, the vast majority, well in excess of 90%, as I said earlier, have been natural causes heart attacks, some suicides, death by uh, other prisoners. And so it had nothing to do with the actual police brutality or to do with uh, corrective services. And as I said earlier, that doesn't mean that there were some cases, and I just named a few of them. But this all cannot be just blamed on colonisation, segregation and racism. Indigenous carceration rates have nearly doubled since 1991. Suicide rates began escalating in the 19, late 1980s after civil rights were won, and, we, and that was done in the 60s and early 70s, where we got, uh, we were, uh, by law, treated equal to every other Australian. After the 1967 referendum, after land rights, after the Mabo case, and while the treatment of Indigenous Australians have vastly improved. I argue that the case that is that it stems from chronic intergenerational welfare dependency and social breakdown, stemming from the mass uh, transition of Indigenous people from the early 70s from work to welfare. And we will not see changes unless Indigenous kids get to school, in education, Indigenous people are working in real jobs, not just some government payout. They're actually in working in the commercial sector. They're working in, uh, in, in jobs like trades or uh, 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 professions. And there are real economies in Indigenous communities. Until that happens, we'll always have this struggle of uh, people living in poverty and uh, crime uh, and uh, drugs and alcohol being those issues that stem from that. I've argued all the time that if we are going to make any real differences, and this is what come out of our uh, inquiry into the South Australian uh, uh, adult prison systems, is that, and this will not change until we actually get all our kids attending school most of the time, in fact up to 90% of the time, and that we get uh, uh, them then transferring into the workforce as, as educated, skilled uh, workers, and that we have in, in these indigenous communities, we actually have businesses operating and investment from the private sector to get those jobs that need to be created. And, and the governments need now to refocus back on those things. I think they have been uh, shifted from that focus in the last year or so. Uh, looking at this uh, voice, this Indigenous voice to Parliament, and a number of other issues. In fact, I looked at some of the the advice that's coming out of the uh, what they call the Peaks, the Coalition of Peaks, which is the Coalition of Peak Indigenous Organisation, and out of those 50 uh, uh, advisory uh, organisations, not one is a business. Not one 
is looking at an economist, not one a business people. So all we've got is going back, and this is one of the fears I have, we're shifting back into the old days prior to the, um, uh, the coalition government coming to power in 20, 2013. We have to get them to focus back on that if we are going to make a real difference in the life of Indigenous people. Thank you. Many thanks, Warren, for a, a great talk. Now we go to Josephine Cashman. Josephine, thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much for inviting me, um, Jared and, and the Sydney Institute. It's, it's a great honour. I want to acknowledge that um, all the great elders that have worked hard, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, to make this Australia great. Um, I'm a, a Waramai and colonial heritage, and I'm extremely lucky um, to know my ancestry. We have to acknowledge uh, how we've worked together as a, to make Australia what it is today, and I'm certainly proud of both. Today we're talking about Black Lives Matter in Indigenous Australia, and I just want to say right away, they don't matter for Marxist BLM. And actually, the whole philosophy or the whole underpinning of Aboriginal affairs has failed. And to paint a picture of the colossal failure, one must look at when the Commonwealth took over some of the states and territories' responsibility, or I would say their responsibility under the Constitution in 1973, with when Gough Whitlam was the Prime Minister. There have been 43 years worth of funding. And, for example, it's created a complicated organisational maze. Just in Queensland alone, there are 1,000 Aboriginal organisations. And I want to now paint that picture. So we've got 43 years worth of funding with a maze, an organisational maze of institutions um, that oversee large distribution of money. Most of it is difficult to audit. Um, uh, people evaluate their own programs. And one would be very worried and reflect on the socialist structure of it. It's even in our own federal bureaucracy now, measures against things like for funding acquitting grants, systemic racism. Uh, one even wonders how a person would measure against that. And this is across the board, including programs where children are sent to some of the most prestigious schools in Australia. Um, the whole system is, I would say, a socialistic system. And where has it ever worked in the world? So no wonder we have the sort of results we have. And on that, I want to make a comparison internationally to where it has been successful at the, the similar period of time. I have worked all my adult life in Aboriginal affairs and I've had some epiphanies which I'll share with you later. But I worked for two and a half years in Arnhem Land as a senior solicitor. And I knew right then, this is not an issue of Aboriginal people offend more. This is an issue of economic marginalisation and people not being full citizens of the country. That's it. So I actually met um, a former Attorney General of Alaska who um, was at that time working as a Chief Operating Officer of a, a business called Nano Development Corporation. And I mentioned that because in 1971, the Nixon, President Nixon, along with the longest serving Republican senator who died in a plane crash, unfortunately, negotiated a um, law, Native um, Claims Settlement Act, which saw um, 13 regional Alaskan corporations be ceded um, with an with amount of money and some preferential contracting. Now, if you look at this group, these regional Alaskan corporations, their payroll alone in 2017 was $950 million. They employed in 2017 over 15,000 people and their combined revenue was $9.13 billion. 
That's revenue, not turnover. I actually ended up working with this um, Alaskan group and at that time, and I expect they still do, as part of the preferential contracting system they set up in 1971, they fueled the President's plane. They designed, implemented and monitored the White House security system. They own their own mine. And when they want to fund their cultural programs, they have the money. I know that at the time I was working with them, there were some traditional owners who, some of them do live a cultural lifestyle. And, um, and, and they get shareholding, so it's a matter for them, but there was, there was a missing opportunity and they just bought a hotel in Anchorage because they had the money and the independence. And what I, um, after having over 25 years working on the ground, it's very clear to me that the whole system needs a massive overhaul. This Black Lives Matter is not relevant at all, and I thank Uncle Warren for going over all the major points because it's clear. Um, uh, Victimisation of Aboriginal women and children and the breakdown of families is really what one should be concerned about. But unfortunately, those who are on the ground do not run these organisations. And the organisational leaders are in fact, they overtake the voice of the people on the ground. Black Lives Matter, these other slogans are designed to get more money and ensure that their money is secure. Now, I know this because my journey um, has been very interesting around Aboriginal people on the ground having a voice. But what I, to contextualise the massive issues that are, that are being swept under the carpet. I'd like to refer you to the Crime Commission report, which was never released. Luckily, I got a redacted version of it. In 2006 to 2014, Prime Minister John Howard commissioned the Crime Commission um, uh, to do a major review into criminality into Aboriginal communities. They, um, this was a, a, a great review because every single police force in Australia participated and they did, um, uh, uh, I, think, I think it's around 3,000 um, covert and overt operations and they looked at the major issues in Aboriginal Australia and of course they're the ones that you know about, substance abuse, violence, child abuse. But one of the major emerging trends that came out of that was the abuse of power and the emerging links to organised crime. And what you see in places where they have double standards um, is this sort of thing occurring. Many of the people who um, are self-appointed leaders, organisational leaders, from my work on the ground, they do not represent the whole of the Aboriginal community. And I'm going to talk about now that I, um, I, uh, I've got a lot of family in Kempsey and before, I think it was late last year, I went to Kempsey and I, some of my relations there, and this is the highest proportional Aboriginal population, right, 12.5%, um, were saying to me, we're trapped, it's like a, you know, and they were saying they believed it was racism. So I did a little bit of digging and I worked out there's $80 million worth of services going into Kempsey annually for about 4,000 Aboriginal people. And further digging of that, we realised that every single Aboriginal organisation there had failed in governance and there are a lot of people on the ground who are absolutely fed up with the waste of money, the bullying, the intimidation, the lack of voice. A lot of people are frightened to speak up. And this is what, this is the reality of what is going on on the ground. There's lots of Christians and, and good people who don't even participate in drug taking who've been trying to get a voice, but nobody is listening to them because the organisational framework is so strong. It's what struck me with the Uluru Statement when I 
did my own survey and I realised that many people on the ground didn't even know what it was and weren't even told, weren't even given the opportunity to participate. And then when you look into who's on that panel, it's the same people now who've had funding for decades and they're saying that it's racism. When you look at the funding, Aboriginal people get double the expenditure of every other Australian. So my conclusion was that actually the quiet Aboriginal Australians and the quiet Australians are actually being pit against each other and the organisational framework is, it is very socialistic. If you can look at land rights in Alaska, people were given freehold. Uh, they, 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 were, they did joint ventures with people like Sodexo, they own a mine, etc. They were able to make their own decisions and to develop business relationships. Here, the idea of the communal land title has just really been designed, especially in New South Wales, when you look at it, I dug into it, um, before the Land Rights Act, sorry about the complication, um, there was an Aboriginal um, land trust which actually held land, it was run very efficiently. And, and this was in the late 1970s, and I'm sure Uncle Warren would correct me, but there are a lot of pastors on that board. And when the RAND government came in, it was um, Mar um, um, Judas Bergman, um, it was uh, Heather Goodall, um, and I think Marcia Langton, who came in with the RAND government, and establish the Land Council um, Act, which we're still under in New South Wales. And when you look at the structure, it's very anti-normal um, uh, uh, governance principles. And what struck me about the US, because I met a lot of the native groups, and they actually have regular conferences, and I sat at a billion dollar table, where all the native groups turned over more than a billion, that here, they're able to revenue. And they were saying to me, well, you can really clearly see in, in America the groups that are in poverty and the groups aren't. And I said to them, well, what is that? He said, the ones that come under mainstream uniform commercial code, under mainstream law, they are successful. The ones that are under some sort of Indian foot law or um, a, double, a, a double system, they're the ones who are susceptible to corruption, to misuse of money. And if you think about it, I'll go back to the point, in Queensland, there's a thousand Aboriginal organisations under a separate law. Um, the Commonwealth um, registers Indigenous organisations. There um, is a total lack of law and order in Aboriginal communities. I would argue, and I have been arguing for a long time, for more police officers in Aboriginal communities. I am still getting calls from people who, uh, for example, the, the, the community who Miss Senator, the incoming Senator Thorpe is, um, is from, a community called Lake Tyres on the Victorian border. Um, they have, they, I've been contacted by people there who've had to wait hours for the police to arrive with people who are running around the communities with axes. And I have been called, I did a speech about it many years ago, I was contacted by um, my sons from that uh, family, is from that community too, of someone being chased with a knife on ice and the police wouldn't go in until they had a meeting with the elders. And then when you compare that to what we know is the truth, the Commonwealth knows, they should release the report, and the other agencies know, that there's serious law and order issues, it's no wonder that Aboriginal people may feel that democracy isn't the best option for them. Because if you've got um, communities where every single organisation is corrupt, they don't necessarily understand um, how to be a full citizen. Um, they um, have been cut out, I believe, um, had second class application of the law in their communities. And BLM is another example of elevating the offenders. No one talks about the victims. 
it feeds in to people's ideology around how they think Australia would be better off in a socialist type of arrangement. But they've had 43 years, these organisations of constant funding. Things have to change. And if you took the money these, these services are getting in, in, in a year, you could actually put that money towards a structure like the Alaskan Regional Corporations where people actually can control their genealogy. And that comes to another point. There is an absolute influx of people who are non-Indigenous who are now claiming Aboriginality. And the way that um, I get lots of calls about it actually because the way these things are structured, if you get the numbers, you can roll people out of their own organisations. Um, and Aboriginal people actually feel like they're being, uh, they're, they're being mistreated and can unfortunately, um, if they don't know by the contrary, can see, see that as racism. So the work I'm doing with um, Aboriginal women in, in the foundation is helping Aboriginal women in particular to become full citizens of the country. Now there are problems in a democracy, there is, is a thing we have to be vigilant of with our services. Occasionally there'll be a police officer who doesn't follow the rules, but they will be nine times out of ten bullying the other police officers and they need to be held to account and reported. Well, in Wilcannon, for example, there's 25 services and no one owns a computer, they don't know how to write letters, and they're told all the time that their issues are to do with intergenerational trauma. Now, people who do believe in conservative principles should have a big think about that, because why are we treating Aboriginal people like they are kids and they can't heal themselves? Why is the state interfering in Aboriginal people's families? I think this is a time for the government and others to have a good look at them themselves and to say, how, what is the environment? Are we setting people up to be the best citizens? I'm hoping, and, and, and it's been quite transformational because I've spent a couple of months with the women of Wilcannia. They're very active now on social media. They're doing their own videos. And the problem is, at the moment in the mainstream media, they don't want to hear these voices. We've got to bring those voices up to have reform. And we've also got a, um, it is quite a complicated issue, but the basis is that we live in a wonderful democracy. And why are we applying double standards to any human being? The investment now needs to be in um, helping Aboriginal people have their own voice and build their own confidence. Um, that's why I believe BLM, they do not care about Aboriginal people, they do not care about Australians, and in fact, um, it's avoiding the real issues. Thank you. Thanks to both of you for lively uh, presentations. And so we come to our question discussion period. And some of our members have sent in some questions, and I'll uh, mention them along the way. Now, as you know, we're doing this because of the time of pandemic, so we're doing our virtual meeting. So I thought that's a good thing to look at in regard to aspects of what you both said. So first to Warren, you spoke about the economic problems and some successes, but economic problems facing Indigenous Australians. Presumably, like all other Australians, this will, these will be made, what's bad will be made worse by the pandemic. So how do you see the response of Indigenous Australians to the pandemic in an economic sense? Well, well, the, the issues is, is what we had to do prior to the, uh, the pandemic, but we've got to do a lot more. Uh, in, in regard to uh, focusing on what the pandemic is. And, 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 and you are right, it, 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 yes, it, we're focusing on Indigenous people in Australia, but it, it's something we could do for all Australians. It, it's about how do we get our uh, economy moving again and getting... Uh, and, we, and this is one of the problems of the past, we always talked about jobs, and that was sort of like putting the cart before the horse. To have jobs, you've actually got to have businesses. You've got to have businesses operating Especially in rural and remote Australia, it's about small businesses. Uh, they're the biggest employers. And so we need to, to, to actually focus on that. And I, look, I've been in a lot of regional and remote communities, and the issue for me isn't that there isn't jobs there, 
It's just that usually the jobs that are there are done from people that fly in and out, and that, and that the uh, and that the locals themselves are actually not involved in in, in, the, in the economic uh, areas of their community, and they're mainly all government stuff. And so we need to shift it to a more uh, private sector investment. I wrote in the Fin Review recently about we need to have a, a private sector investment into communities and for this to happen. And it doesn't have to be great stuff. It can be simple things like mowing the lawns and, and, and doing the, the waste management and, do, and, and fixing the houses. In fact, I, I talked to a number of them. But we've got to start focusing. My concern is that through the pandemic and also it uh, is that we've shifted away from this uh, economic approach and, uh, and of course the government's going to be in a lot of debt as well. So we're going to have to really uh, work with the, the private sector to get those jobs and businesses moving. Thanks. Josephine, uh, in relation to the pandemic, you spoke about the family problems faced by many Indigenous families, uh, violence and related matters, uh, which is true, true throughout the community, but the view is that the pandemic will probably make this worse. Is that how you think? Because of the economic consequences of people being forced into unemployment where they were previously employed and related matters? Uh, well, uh, the, commu the communities I've been working with is overall high unemployment anyway, and no jobs. So I'm not sure whether that helps, but I would, if, if I may, I'd, I'd like to touch on, I think um, there's a serious issue for all Australians with the economic crisis. But I do think that this is an opportunity to reevaluate the amount of money that's going into social services, into Aboriginal communities, and to look at economic models because um, Warren discussed 20 to 70, up to 70 percent. I thought it was 33 percent of Australia's land mass yeah. is actually is actually tied up. And I, when I've been out to some of these communities, uh, there is those extreme green groups that are sort of hovering around. So you can't develop your land, you know, and it's capitalism's the problem. But I do think once Aboriginal people understand, there is massive opportunities for those communities with the unused land. Some of it should be used because it's, you know, these, these gum tree forests and stuff that explode when a match goes near them. To actually look at, well, where can we develop Australia? I think we've been on a steady decline because a lot of this, you know, the green energy scam, etc. But like for all Australians, Aboriginal people struggle to pay their power bills. That really affects them. I did a survey of 10% of the Wilcannia families and the major issue for them was the cost of power, like every other Australian. So like every other Australian, we've got to get the cost of power down. And I believe we've got to start burning our own coal. We've got to get industry back, and we've actually got to. We've actually, and I think the key to this in Aboriginal Australia, like it is in mainstream Australia, is actually educating the public on what the real issues are, so that we build up that momentum. Because I think the pandemic has brought a lot of bad things, but it's been, brought a lot of people. And I speak to quiet Australians, Aboriginal Australians, a lot on the ground. And all of them are starting to reevaluate. Where have our industries gone? Why aren't people working? And unless you fix the issue with power prices and probably the cost of labour in Australia, we are heading for a socialist sort of um, where the government is going to continually. And I tell you what, I don't think there's anybody who enjoys in the long term being on welfare. I, uh, from my view, when I speak to people, they want a job. They want what every other person wants, which is simple things, things for their family. They might want a big TV or a car or to go, you know, to go and do some things with the family. Um, but the problem is, in particular, like you're talking about the housing, it's all external contractors. They have no control. They're not allowed. They've been renting systemically. I mean, in Moore Canyon, they have a wonderful sandstone quarry. They could be making their own houses. But it doesn't fit into this, I'm going to be quite blunt here, to the socialist agenda, you know? Well, Warren, yeah, just, sorry, just to finish off on that, one of the, I, was talk, I saw Professor Hickey at Sydney University's, the Professor of Brain there, uh, article a few, uh, last month, and where he was talking about the concerns of the pandemic is going to have a, a really big epidemic in, in, in rising of suicide rates, uh, mental health issues and so on, because human beings are social 
people. We like to get out and talk and, and mix and mingle with them. And this is one of the, because uh, the, the Indigenous communities have been in lockdown for a while uh, up in the Territory and other areas. Uh, so I, I see the source, uh, uh, my big fear uh, is that the, the rates of suicide, the rates of violence in these communities will increase. I um, hope I'm wrong, uh, but because of this, this lockdown in these areas. In which there's not a lot of COVID-19 at the moment, is there in, Abri in Aboriginal no, areas? No, it's, that, that, what, the lockdowns have really worked in Aboriginal communities in that sense of uh, reduction of, uh, well, two things. One is the, uh, the pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, and the other one is in, reg in regard to the flu and, and influenza. Now, those figures are, are drastically re reduced. It's really amazing. That's, that's the good news in regard to the lockdown. The bad news is the economy has now gone to crap uh, and, the, uh, and, and we've got this fear, this, this mental health fear and, and violence in these communities now because of those uh, being uh, locked up for such a while. Going back to your point, which is what uh, um, Josephine also spoke about, I think you had a figure of something like Indigenous ownership, I suppose, about 30%. You yeah. said it's heading to 70% by what kind of year? I'll be about yeah, in the next 20 years. The next and 20 that's years. based on the court cases that are now before the so, uh, federal court. So, so come back to now, 30%. So what about individual Indigenous Australians? I mean, do they actually own any of that? Or is that, I mean, can you do anything with it apart from what a land council says you can do? This is the problem. There's two two major problems, and 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 Josephine's right in regard. Uh, I've always said this that uh, when we look at uh, Indigenous affairs, we always separate that from the wider Australian economy. In fact, when we when uh, when I was in the Labor Party, the Liberal Party, that when you have a conversation about okay, what have we got to do? Well, when it talks about the wider Australian community, they talk about the economic management and get how do you create uh, businesses and, and and looking at the issue. Uh, red tape. Well, the, the problem uh, in Indigenous communities, we all we sort of switch over straight away to an almost to a, 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 as Josephine said, a socialist approach, where we've got all these people on welfare. There's no real proper planning in regard to lifting people out of that welfare system. Now, to for a simple argument for me is I don't know any race of people or any group of people in the world in history who have ever got out of poverty and, and created a good economy where people can get educated, fed, have their housing, have jobs and businesses operating uh, without a, a focus on the economy and how we manage that economy to, to forward. So, and, and it's not rocket science to work out, but it's the private sector that does this and we need to have more private sector and commercial operations happening within these Aboriginal communities and with, and, 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 and and proper and in reducing the red tape, like I, I remember Jumba Wild Maya Willie, who's the clan leader up at uh, up on, on, on Beniala in North East Arnhem, he was battling for his people to have private home ownership on their land, and it was a battle that was, has been going on now for 15 years, and uh, you know, and, it's, and, and the biggest problems were. The Northern Land Council in this process that it took them 15 years before they come on board and and say yes we look at this thing. The problem we have we have uh, levels of bureaucracy. You know we always talk about states, local governments, and the federal government in in the federation, but but in Aboriginal communities you've got that those three levels of government plus you've got then several levels of Indigenous governance and that's that's the problem. You've got to go through so much work to get cut through to do anything. So when you're on the ground, Josephine, uh, mm -hmm. how does anyone make a decision? Well, they constantly, like for, for, I'll give for Kenya, for example, they have an interagency meeting with the government, two levels of government, and 25 services. And these two ladies out of 500 go, and they're burnt out because they go. They know exactly what needs to be done with their community, right? And they're getting to the point where they think, this system is set up to, it's, and, and they get told it's racism, it's, in, it's intergenerational trauma, it's racism. No, it's socialism. And what I wanted to say is, I think the pandemic's a perfect time to actually look at, to actually look at a huge restructure 
Now, what um, President Nixon did very well, and you'll look recently before the pandemic, Pre President Trump set up the um, opportunity areas. Yeah. We saw African Americans go up in the middle class like they never have. Um, and the minority um, uh, development um, area, they have a department, they, they don't have a, a department that's an Aboriginal organisation, they have a, um, a, their own department in, within commerce. And they look at preferential contracting, opportunity zones, which is seen um, black entrepreneurialism yeah. and um, the highest African American employment. That's why it's got amazing support. And they really, I, I spoke to a lot of African American native, they love it because it's freedom. People can't name it, and that's what I'm helping people do on the ground, to, to decipher it and say, no, the Australian people really do care about you, or they wouldn't be giving you double, yeah, right? Yeah. Simply, the problem is this, the people who are running these things, I think, play the racism card and say, well, this is Aboriginal, like there's a second, like the, the second standard. And we must resist that. And also, if you look at um, law and order, is not equally applied? It's very actually dangerous, not just for Aboriginal communities, but I believe for Australia in general. Because if you look at the people who are sort of heading these organisations and stuff, very clearly have quite strong Marxist philosophy. And I think it's been a bit of a loophole. And we've seen that with the, with the, the Bruce Pascoe rewriting of Australian history um, to suit themselves. And, you know, th th I think this is something that has to be dealt with immediately. Yeah. Well, there's a few, there's a few, yeah, as we talk, I said earlier about truth talking, and this is the type of stuff that we've got to start getting to. This idea, I just find it bizarre, that, like it's never been a better time to be an indige Indigenous person in Australia, especially if you're a young Indigenous person. The opportunity is there. You, it, it, there's, there's trust funds and, and government funding and private sector funding on in, uh, getting indige Indigenous people through high school, into universities, into postgraduate studies. And, and these are all support. Now, if Australia, of course Australia has some racism in it, like every other country in the world, but it doesn't make us a racist country. We, we have, uh, and I've talked with you, because I'm an Australian just as much as anyone else, we have bent over backwards and really worked hard to get the people into jobs, to get people educated and get things happening. Uh, I have uh, some serious concerns at the moment, and we got like one of the closing the gap targets we had put in place uh, uh, under the uh, Turnbull and, and, and Abbott government was getting kids to school. The percentage of kids getting to school and, that, and, and state and territories had to, to meet those targets. Well, that's now been abandoned. Now, my thing is, uh, is uh, even if it's a bad school, at least you're getting an education. Uh, so this, but if you're not turning up to school, you're getting no education whatsoever. And so these are these are major concerns we've got to deal with. And you look at we looked at opportunity uh, zones, uh, what Trump was doing in the United States, uh, and they were really good what they were doing. And about you're going into African American communities there, and it ha they got employment figures up until prior to the pandemic, of course, uh, is, uh, that they've never seen. Uh, since uh, reckon, uh, since the reconstruction period, so that's a hundred and what hundred and six hundred sixty years, hundred forty yep. years. Yep. That is just amazing that, that that they've got all these people shifting in. Port. I had a friend of mine who's a Qantas pilot. He was in in uh, uh, Louisiana, Baton Rouge there, and and he said, I said, is it true about this stuff? And he said, he said yes. He said I was there. I was in a in a uh, in a bar. And it was, uh, Battle of Ruse is a large African American po population there, and and he said to him, he said, "Do you like Trump?" And they said, "Yes, we do like Trump." And I said, "Why?" And they said, "Because we've got jobs, we've got jobs, and we've got businesses, and that's and so those are the things that we should be looking at about how we can uh, do this, and so people become self reliant. You you. Uh, you know, your government can give you as many, uh, you know, every Aboriginal person can have a psychologist or a counsellor or whatever, but that is not going to make a difference until people uh, take uh, responsibility for what their, their actions are and build and build their community. Well, moving to the converse side of that, I mean, one of our, yeah. one of our members has said that Henry, Henry Urgis has yeah. called for the moving of remote communities which have unsustained, which have sustained unacceptable levels of violence, particularly to women. 
is it possible to move such communities, well, or what can you do I, about such? I, I mean, these are communities where presumably there are, there are few or, or, or no jobs. So I'm very concerned um, because my view is that a, there's a lot of voiceless decent leaders. They're voiceless because the social services system, they don't have a say on what happens to their community. And this is why I think in some ways when things are said like that, there's an uproar because they think, oh my goodness, someone else is gonna make a decision you know, for us and move software. We already don't have any decisions on our, in our community. And to be quite honest, very corrupt people and some of the very violent people run the communities. So I think it's, yes, that is, there are people I know who are willing to move for jobs, but we've got to look at that. But the thing is, I think that that's a big issue for the states and territories as well, and we know why that other matter was raised. But I think now, after the pandemic, there's a, how, how could you see that was the solution necessarily if people haven't even been given the opportunity, um, like every other Australian, to have access to their land? They're in a, a communal type communal title situation where Aboriginal people from other areas, for example Victoria and New South Wales, can come and join their land council and actually take over their land, I think these discrete groups should be treated as like a fa any family group, hold their land in trust and be able to have some private ownership. And you see with people uh, like Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher who gave home ownership to you know, people in, living in the slums, things changed overnight. It's not rocket science, it's not another program. And I think what I'm trying to encourage is Aboriginal people on the ground to have a voice and to share their ideas rather than this top down or, which I think happens, a lot of Australian people go, oh my God, there's so much money, we've got to do this and that. But the, 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 the solution is more Aboriginal people becoming full citizens, a lot of them don't vote, understanding what citizenship is, and participating and working together to look at um, you know um, economic models, but not as a whole as individuals, not as a whole sort of scheme, because it's yeah. not going to work that way. Yeah, and also being told that you're, you you're oppressed and you're a victim all the time. My parents taught me to be proud of who you are, take responsibility of the good and the bad that you do in your life, uh, and, and you don't become a victim and stop blaming other people. If you're not happy with things, make a change. Get up and, and make a change. And well, I, I had this, I, I, I was stupid, I admit I was stupid, I had this twi a Twitter argument with this guy, nothing worse to do than argue on Twitter, <laughs> I tell you. Yeah. Uh, and, this, and, and he was telling me how oppressed I was, and I'm sitting there going, I'm not oppressed. What are you talking about? There's no laws anymore about Aboriginal people, and I, and he and he said, no, but you're you're Aboriginal, you're black, you, therefore you must you must be oppressed. And I said, I'm not oppressed. And he said, then he, then the, the, this is when I decided to mute him. He he said, you will wake up one day, Warren, and you will realise that you are an oppressed person because of your colour. And this is what we're t this is what they're teaching kids. So so what you, you, if you're a kid, you, you're living in poverty somewhere. Why would you want to get out of pot? Because you're going to be oppressed. You've been told that you that all white people are bad. You've been told that all uh, you know other races in Australia are bad, and they they hate you and oppress you. And then you and you've been taught that you'll never go. Even if you did work hard, you're still oppressed because of, uh, because of who your colour and your and your race. And that, that is just insane nonsense that we're, that people are, are talking about. No wonder we have problems in our communities. That's what we're teaching our kids. It reminds me, I saw recently on, on Fox News, this black woman from Latin America mm. and uh, telling this group of whites that she's not oppressed. And yeah, I saw that. And they're telling that she is <laughs> oppressed. She's, I'm it's, doing okay. It's bizarre. That's just the, the yeah. funny thing about it. The most, I've, I've experienced racism, of course, ever, it, and a lot of immigrants come to Australia, but they, they worked hard and they, got, and they got on with their life. The only racism I have copped in the last 22 years has been from the left, and I've been abused uh, for uh, because oh, you want to go, you're a capitalist, you want to go out and do this stuff, so you must be a coconut, or you must be an Uncle Tom. And I tell you, there is a very good uh, 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 a film out at the moment which you can look at, which is Uncle Tom. It's called Uncle Tom by Larry Elder, and and he gets all and he starts off with this trade, this tradie guy, this African American trade, and it runs through 
uh, what they've been told and how they've been taught and how they want to break out of this 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 straitjacket of believing that you're oppressed, that you're a victim. There's and racism everywhere. I, I, I sit there and go, you know, the, as I just said, the only racism I get is on Twitter and some idiots calling me names. Well, Paul Bongiorno called you an uncle. Yeah, that's right. And then he, he said he didn't know what it meant. He didn't know what it meant. Well, well he writes for the Saturday paper, so what do you expect? Yeah. <laughs> Josephine? Yeah, I think it's very troubling. My view is that, um, you know, having this experience um, with... Uh, um, I, th I think people supporting the rewriting of Australian history mm. and they take a certain position and I think it's this cultural Marxism you know wanting to divide people into um, categories and having um, groups where they can be they can be triumph their victimness but the good news is Jared the very good news is these people who are sort of have this ideology do not have the numbers on the ground, right? The, the people on the ground have been told this, but when you, the, 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 these leaders who are sort of the far left don't sit with the people on the ground. And my view is um, we can bring Australia together and we can have a defence against this if we speak to the people on the ground and we, have, we start building those relationships because because it's socialist structures there, people go, oh, there's all this money going in, it's being sorted. But what it's actually done is it's undermined our society. People aren't having relationships with one another. Now, I'll tell you a quick story. My, uh, my mum uh, went back to a community and ran the Aboriginal Medical Service and they had a, a, a reserve called Perfleet, which used to be called Sunrise Station, and my ancestor actually gave it back. Um, and the mum, mum was talking to the old ladies and they said, oh, well, the, 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 we used to love going to the church. And our non-Indigenous family and friends would come to the church every Sunday to Perthlake, which used to be on the highway. And mum just presumed, oh, it was burnt down. It must have been someone on the reserve. No. In the 1970s, late 1970s, we found out, activists from Sydney went right up the north coast and burnt all the churches. Right? And when that happened, and there were people who came in who told the Aboriginal community, you cannot be a Christian anymore, and it, and it correlated with their rolling of that other group with all the pastors from the Inland Mission, um, when the Rand government came in, they rolled them all, and they said, you can only practice Aboriginal culture, which is silly, because there's a lot of Christians who are proud of their Aboriginal culture as well. But for me, that was the point when Aboriginal people started to get very isolated from their own community in the town. And then these groups would say, oh, it's Aboriginal business, no one can be involved. So in effect, part of bringing Australia together is breaking through that isolation and getting rid of these people who, are, to my view, they're troublemakers and traders. Yeah. Um, who want these industries of welfare to keep on going with very little compliance and, and no return. And they're the ones who are screaming about racism when they've got billions of dollars. When mum was running, because you went up there, mm. when mum was running the medical service, she had millions of dollars to administer for 200 people. It's 13 cars, you know, a lot of staff. What if you sit down and told the people, this is what's being spent on you, right? You can either have a business, you can look after your health, or you're not getting it any. They're the sort of conversations we have to have on the ground, not in the public, yeah, you one, know? One of the, one of the biggest uh, criticisms that we had and attacks when we were on the, the Prime Minister's Indigenous Advisory Council was uh, uh, there were 150 program streams uh, for, uh, for Indigenous Affairs. Uh, we, we shrunk that down to five uh, because, there's, because you had to have all this compliance stuff. With it. Now, that was a, a saving of $57 million in paperwork, a saving of 50, $57 million in paperwork. We got abused because everyone was saying we're cancelling these programs, but not. No, we didn't. We just brought them down into, into a very more structured uh, approach. We, 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 uh, some of these organisations didn't have to have people sitting there filling out paperwork all the time. They actually were getting out and doing the, the health service or the legal service or whatever the service they were doing. Uh, and that's the whole thing, you know, people get caught up, I, I get sick and tired of having discussed. 
I was talking to a minister years ago, and I said, uh, "What have you, you're the minister? What have you done in Indigenous affairs?" And he said, I, I've, "I've got an extra half a billion dollars, five hundred billion dollars." And I said, "I said no, that wasn't my question. Yeah. I said, what have you yeah. actually done? Yeah. What was the outcome? What, what? Yeah. And this is where we wanted to, to change this whole pro. What are the outcomes? If you're going to spend money, how is it efficiency get? And the product is Productivity Commission actually said it. They said most of that money that's spent for Indigenous affairs doesn't even get into the ground. Yes. It, it's spent through the bureaucracies and spent for all these organisations. And there's a lot of corruption, which the Crime Commission and organised crime, unfortunately. I, I believe if you look at it, shown financial lawyers, it looks very much like a, a, pla a thing to clean money. I'm sorry. It's, 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 and people know that a lot of these leaders are crooked, crooked but they, they report them and nothing's done or the police don't turn up. And I've been in Aboriginal communities where houses were firebombed and the police wouldn't turn up. Mm. Um, so, and I think the police are in a hard situation too because they get called racists or they send young police officers out to, prop, you know, um, but, but we've seen models which work and that's good old fashioned policing, very experienced police officers and, mm. and, and the rates reduce dramatically when you have that sort of situation now, really. We've got a final question because yeah, sure. we're sort of running out of time, yeah. but uh, one of our members has asked about the Black Lives Matter marches in Australia. Now, as you know, there's a controversy about this, whether this sort of made people relax in relation to COVID-19. But beyond, oh, I mean, that's part of it. But beyond that, I mean, do you do you find that kind of demonstration, the general demonstration, at a time of pandemic or not? Do you find that helpful to the cause or not helpful to the cause, or does it matter? Yeah, look, uh, let's start uh, with uh, Warren. Yeah, finish with. Uh, yeah. There's two two things there. One one in the pandemic total insanity because you know having all those people crowding together and especially with the Aboriginal communities with the health issues and that there it, it could have been a very dangerous situation and this and the second part of that it did it did as, as you said it did flow into the reasons why people uh, decided to flaunt the laws and that because they, they just said well if 10,000 people or whatever thousands of people go out there can demonstrate why am I locking myself away? Why am I giving myself a problem? Yep, but the big thing, the big whole thing about it is, and this is, uh, is this, this untruth talking about uh, the Black Lives Matter stuff. It is, to me, we're not focusing on the real issues. And one of the concerns I have is in regard to the, what, uh, one of the targets of setting the closing the gap is about incarceration rates. To me, it is not about incarceration rate, it's about reducing crime. How do we reduce domestic violence situations, the treatment of women, the treatment of uh, abuse of kids and so on? That's what we should be targeting and focusing and getting in that mindset. Look, I can, uh, if you go to look at incarceration rates, I can fix them tomorrow morning, I just let everyone out of jail. And these people aren't, you know, there's other things they talk about, like they say that figure 432 people who were and died in custody. That gives the impression that they, these people were were killed by police and corrective services. And that is so far from the truth, it is not funny. Uh, and it, it's only a handful of people who have been, uh, have been uh, killed in this situation. And as, as we said, there's a, there's a lot less deaths of Aboriginal people in incarceration than there is in the general population. More, but and that's that, whatever statistic you want to have a look at, whether what whether it's percentages or actual numbers, it's it's it, the end, end result is that we need to be focusing on the real issues. And and, and Josephine, I'll let you finish off. It, it has raised a number of these issues, uh, and has copped a big backlash in regard to it. Josephine, helpful or unhelpful? Well, I first off, I believe in people's right to protest, but I think it's very unhelpful when there's pandemic on. And secondly, there's been a lot of protesting for the last 40 years, but there's been a lot of money. I mean, they can't claim. The issue here is Aboriginal people understanding their full citizen rights, because there's many marginal seats that can be won on the Aboriginal vote. We've got a, a young population, 50% under 25, and the thing that the, 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 I think people are desperate, it's particularly on the ground level, for a solution 
Um, we have to, as all citizens, extend a hand to these people as a community and help people learn about democracy because that's where they're going to be able to impact the policy. And I think that, you know, what the issue I have, and I worked very hard on the social media around the time when it was going off in the US and all this statues, etc. Because what I realised, and a lot of us did, you probably did as well, um, that in the celebrities get involved, right? So I had to really, uh, I'd say a few king hits, right? At some celebrities, Magnus the Blancy, they're all like, oh, Aboriginal people. I had to go really hard on them on Twitter, and I did it because I've noticed that in the US, the celebrities come in, they're all Aboriginal people, and then it just, the public goes out. And then it just escalates. So I think one thing I want to say is we should be very proud in Australia because we haven't had that level. But there is a weakness, not just in Aboriginal communities, but in our university sector, um, with our children being sort of taught stuff that isn't quite correct. Um, and particularly, I find that these Aboriginal units, which were set up by activists, and um, uh, most of them are all interconnected and they're teaching quite extreme ideology and it's, it's very simplistic. Um, and it's not about nation building, it's about sort of bringing down the structures. And, and I think we've, to really overcome that, we've got to be quite serious about what the threat is, who our allies are, which I think are the people on the ground because they're sort of you know, caught in this system. And, who the real people who are pushing this sort of divisive, divide Australia agenda and why they're doing it? Well, many thanks to both of you. We could go on, but yeah. we have time limits, and sure. uh, that's a good thing that we do have time limits, but it would be good to go on, but we can't. So many thanks for two important papers and a great discussion. Well done to both of you. Thank you, Warren. Thank, Thank you, Josephine. Thank you, Jim.